1.26 billion seconds. 1.26 billion seconds is how long I was on this earth before I made a fundamental change in my life at last to become the real person I was and who I felt I always should be and do the things that are important to me. 540 seconds is all it took to start that change. 540 seconds of life-changing moment to become the real me, doing the things that are important to me. But why, why did I wait so long? In fact, why do any of us put off becoming the person that we deserve to be? For me, the answer to that was actually quite simple. A combination of a lack of self-belief and a fear of failure. You see, so many of us are held back by invisible barriers, crippled even by a fundamental lack of belief in our own strength, our own resilience, our own ability to get back from anything should things go wrong. But as you're going to learn from my story, when you need it, we all have that strength and resilience inside of us. It's just I didn't believe it until I had to on Friday, the 4th of March, 2016. Now that day, oh, it started off as any other. I woke up next to my sleepy partner, Bobby. I was eight months pregnant, just finishing a week's annual leave from work and about to start my maternity leave. Bobby woke up and rolled over. And he looked at me with that little glint in his eyes. He pulled me towards him. <laughs> No way, not this morning. That's how I ended up this way the first place. You have to get to work, I've got to get the kids to school. He pouted, but conceded, and he got up, got dressed, and dashed out the door to work, kissing me and my two girls goodbye. You see, I had two daughters already from my previous marriage, my beautiful, beautiful, precious girls. They were aged just 10 and 6 at the time. About a year after I split from their dad, I got together with Bobby. Now, Bobby and I had known each other from way back from our school days and through the wonders of social media, mutual friends, we got together in later life. But whereas I'd done the whole kids thing and marriage, I was in my later 30s, that 1.26 billion seconds might have given a clue to my age. I'm not a dinosaur. Well, I thought the kids thing was behind me. But Bobby had never had children, and he was desperate for a child. And not long after we moved in together, I fell pregnant. He was so excited. I was a little bit scared, because I knew what this whole baby thing involved. Anyway, back to that morning, I dashed around, I got my kids to school, come on, come on, we're late, standard. And I sat there in my daughter's assembly, and at the end, it's all kisses, oh, I love you, I love you, you're so brilliant. And I spotted my six-year-old sat further down with her classmates, and I couldn't resist it, embarrassing mom. Bye, babe, bye, Mwah. love you, see you later, see you after school. Except I didn't know at that point, that I was never going to see them after school that day. I dashed to the gym. I went to the supermarket, and I was pushing the trolley around the aisles. Bobby called me and asked me to meet him at the bank that afternoon. He insisted that he pick me up, and we arranged a time. I got home. I was unpacking the shopping. Crikey, he's late. You know, I'm going to set off. I grabbed my jacket, my bag, my phone. As I left, I called him. Hi, babe. Yeah, just to let you know, I thought I'd start walking down. Yeah, don't, I just wondered where you were. Oh, sorry, babe. Yeah, I got stuck at work, and now I'm stuck in traffic. I'm on the other side of Birmingham. That's all right, sweetheart. I'm going to go and look around the shops, so just give a spell when you get there. All right, darling, I'm sorry. I love you. I love you, too. And I pressed on. It was a cold day. I had my umbrella up, and... My bump was sticking out my jacket, getting wet, and I pressed on to the town centre. 
I'll never forget crossing the road to Trinity Hill. Trinity Hill is a steep downhill alley that leads into a dead-end road that comes up from the ring road around Sutton Coalfield Town Centre. Opposite the end of Trinity Hill is a McDonald's, bus stops and all the town centre shops and here I was at the top of Trinity Hill and I hesitated. You see, at the top stood a memorial to a girl who'd been murdered there 20 years before and it wasn't a place I really liked. But I was being stupid, it was nearly 10 past three on a Friday afternoon. I could see the town centre ahead, there's people walking up and down the hill. Halfway down the alleyway, I heard it. It's a man, he's scruffily dressed, he's got a hoodie on, he, he, his hood's up. He's running. I sped up, I got out to that dead end road. But I just knew that he was behind me. I stepped to one side to let him by. I'll never forget the thud of his arm as it came round me, pulling me backwards into him. I screamed, get off me! I was convinced I was getting mugged. I mean, my handbag was on that side. I'm eight months pregnant, I'm a vulnerable female. As I tried to pull away from him, at the corner of my eye, I spotted it. He pulled a 12-inch kitchen carving knife. What? <gasps> I remember the glint of the blade. I remember the sharp searing pain as it went through my ribs. And I'll never forget that I still had to look down at my own chest to see it. my top was ripped and I was bleeding to realize that I was in fact being stabbed. I screamed, shock, fear, and need to get away, kicked in, please help me. Two men came running. They jumped on the attacker and they pulled him down. But he was still holding on to me and he dragged me down onto the pavement with him. The stabbing was incessant. I screamed, why me? What have I done to you? He said nothing. Then one of the men, they managed to grapple his arm and they pinned it back to the pavement, the one holding the knife. It meant the attacker let go of me to get his own arm back. I was free. I got to my feet. And steadily grappling my bump, trying to go down the hill, I was pouring in blood. I could see McDonald's ahead, people bustling in and out. I could see people waiting at the bus stops. People going about their normal Friday afternoon with absolutely no idea of the horror that was going on just a few hundred yards away. I screamed, help! I could see a car park on my left. If I could just get there... There's cars, there's buildings, I'll be fine. I passed out cold, face first. But when I came round, I was still not giving in. I crawled on my hands and knees to a brick pillar that was by that car park. And I sat on it, pavement, with my back against it, and my bottom on the cold, wet pavement. But I looked up the hill to my absolute horror, the attacker had broken free. He was standing up. He was walking towards me with the knife in hand. My head screamed, Nat, move, get up, get up. But I couldn't. My legs wouldn't work, and all I could do is put my arm up to protect myself. The attacker drew up in front of me, and he crouched down. He held the knife to my face, and he punched me repeatedly in the face to knock me out. When I came round, he was continuing his attack with a knife turning it on my wrist and on my pregnant belly. I felt him fumble with the scarf on my neck and I felt the blade against my throat and I thought, this is it, this is it, this is it. This. And he was gone. An 18-year-old lad who'd been at those bus stops, he'd heard the shouts for help. He'd come running across the ring road. He ran up Trinity Hill, and as he rounded the corner, he saw the attacker over me, and he ripped him off me. He was followed by three police officers who'd been on foot patrol in the town centre. 
They too had heard the shouts for help and they came running with their batons drawn as they rounded the corner. The attacker was over me for a third time. They pinned him to the ground. It's over, mate. Five hundred and forty seconds. The longest nine minutes of my life. And it changed everything. The police battled to give me first aid. They were pressing on my chest. Ambulances were called. An air ambulance helicopter was mobilized. And as I sat there slumped on Trinity Hill, I remember looking up the hill and feeling the life literally drain out of me. And I thought... This is it. I could die here. I, I could actually die. And then a brilliant thing happened. Because an indignant part of my brain kicked in. The attitude part. And it was like, <laughs> no way. Uh-uh. You have not got to 40 years of age to die on a cold, wet pavement on a Friday afternoon in the town centre. No way. And my fight began. I thought about my two beautiful daughters I'd left in assembly that morning and my vigor was renewed. I could not die. In 540 seconds, I had been stabbed 24 times. The knife had hit the outer part of my heart. It hit my right lung, collapsing it, my diaphragm in two places, my liver. He'd cut through my wrist, cutting the artery open and he'd gone through my uterus, carrying my unborn baby. My blood pressure was dropping at a dramatic rate, and as the air ambulance helicopter came in, the doctors ran out of it. They ran to the back of the land ambulance where I was, expecting me to be in cardiac arrest. They were pretty shocked when they came through the door and a bleary-eyed me going, oh yeah. <laughs> I have explained to them, by the way, that Clearly, it takes more than 24 stab wounds to stop me talking. <laughs> just let that be a warning to all of you. I'll just leave that there. Anyway, they made the decision they were going to airlift me immediately. They got me straight into the helicopter. They took off. We went to the nearest trauma center. Eight-minute flight. When we landed, I had less than five minutes left to live. I was literally on the edge of dying. They rushed me to theatre, they operated me for five hours, they put me in a coma. The next morning I came round in critical care to a nurse. Natalie, Natalie, we've got the most amazing news. You have a daughter. She survived. The knife missed her by two millimeters. She was starved of oxygen. She had to be resuscitated at birth. She was now in a coma, having her body called to preserve her brain. But do you know what? She's a fighter. She is a survivor. And like her mom, clearly stubborn when it comes to the whole dying thing. <laughs> but my joy was to be short-lived because police officers then came to my bedside and asked me what I remembered about that day. They then broke the most horrendous news. The man they arrested at the scene, the man they now held at Sutton Coalfield Police Station, the man charged with the attempted murder of me and my unborn baby was Bobby. Bobby, who'd said, I love you, as I walked to the town centre. Bobby, who woke up that morning with a twinkle in his eye. Bobby, I was making a home with, planning my wedding with, whose baby I was carrying. There had been absolutely no warning signs at all. His friends had even gone looking for him the day after the attack, worried about where he was and reported him as missing. There had been no signs and my life was devastated. At times, the mental and the physical pain, I'll be honest, was almost too much to bear. There were days that I wished I hadn't survived. There were days I wished I could end it all. And not because I wanted to die, 
but because I couldn't stand another day of waking up to this pain. But you see, I had a choice. We all have a choice. We can choose to sink or we can choose to swim. We can choose to survive or we can choose to give in. And giving in, that wasn't an option. I hadn't given in on that hill, in that ambulance or in that helicopter and I wasn't about to give in now. You see, I had the most incredible title in the world, Mum. My three girls needed me and I needed them and that was all that mattered. So I would get up, I would fight, I would get dressed, I'd do my hair, do my makeup and look like the mum they really recognised and relied on. I would hold my baby to my chest and I would sing to her. I mean, poor kid, she's been through freaking enough already and there's me singing to her. <laughs> I'm not going to sing to you, don't worry. If I sing in the words of Bob Marley, don't worry about a thing because every little thing is going to be all right because it had to be all right. And do you know what? It was. Because out of this darkness, an incredible thing happened. You see, I'd shed my self-doubt. And I didn't need to question in my own strength, my own resilience, whether I could come back from tough times because I was doing it. I realized I could go on and do things and be things, whatever I wanted to do. And that's what I did. I left my 19-year career in the pharmaceutical industry. I set up two businesses. One a community interest company talking to young people about the reality of knife crime and the reality of being a victim of a stabbing to help try and reduce this horrific upsurge we're seeing across our countries. I've raised thousands for the Midlands Air Ambulance who airlifted me and other charities doing crazy ass stunts. I found talents I didn't know I had. I've written a book. I've got it published. How? Because I believed in myself. You see, on a day in February 1976, at 10 past three in the afternoon, I was born. On a day in March 2016, weirdly, at 10 past three in the afternoon, I was born again. But I didn't need 540 seconds of hell to do this. None of us do. You see, all of you here, we all have a story to tell. We've all got through tough times. We're all survivors in our own journey and we should look back at that journey and we should take our own examples of our own strength and our own resilience and embrace the fact that we are still standing here today and use that to empower ourselves to be whatever we want to be and do whatever we want to do. So my message to you all today, be bold, be brilliant, be the person that you deserve to be right here right now.